Friday, everybody. Good. Today we have a special guest briefer. Uh, you know Brett McGurk, the presidential special envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL. Um, Brett's going to come up here. He'll uh, talk a little bit about where we are in the campaign against ISIL. He'll have time to take a few questions, but only a few. Uh, I'll moderate those as you have in the past. Please identify who you are, who you're with before you ask a question. Let's limit follow-ups if we can so we can uh, keep moving through this, uh, and then we'll get to the regular uh, daily briefing for today. So with that, special envoy. Okay, John, thanks. Um, I thought I'd give a brief update because there's been a lot of interest kind of where we're heading in the next few weeks, but I want to kind of back up at this uh, – this overall global campaign against Daesh and just emphasize the truly global nature of it. So when I've been here before, I've talked about we analyze Daesh in three dimensions. There's the core in Iraq and Syria. We have to shrink their physical space, and we're doing that uh, quite rapidly, which I'll talk about. Then there's the networks. There's the foreign fighter network, the financial network, and the propaganda network, and we're working to chop those up every single day, 24-7. And then there are the affiliates, eight affiliates uh, around the world. Well, one reason we're so focused on this, of course, is their external plotting network. What they're trying to do is a global terrorist organization. So to defeat that, it is a global network, and we've built this global coalition of 67 members. And I just want to kind of give some highlights, starting from the outside in, before I get to Syria and Iraq about what we've done. Um, first, although it is in Syria, the operation in Monbij, which I know a lot of you have covered, uh, we uncovered in that operation, we knew it was a hornet's nest, a trove of their foreign fighters, where they're planning, where they're, where they're plotting, and where they process foreign fighters when they come into the country. Um, since we have gotten Dash out of Monbij, uh, we've recovered a huge troge of in, trove of intelligence, over 15 terabytes of material now. Um, when I was recently in Syria, I kind of saw how we process it all, we disseminate it, we then work as a global coalition to make sure that we're sharing information as rapidly um, as we can. So one thing about the coalition, that when I'm traveling in capitals, what we really emphasize is we need radical information sharing to stay ahead of this threat, and that's what we're trying to do as a coalition. Uh, if we get a phone off of a, a dead ISIL fighter in Monbij and it has a number of telephone numbers into a particular capital or city around the world, we share that information with the coalition members so that they can conduct their own investigation. And this is now really starting to work at light speed, although we want to speed it up. Since August 30th, uh, we've taken out more than 18 ISIL leaders, including, of course, some of their uh, most prominent, and uh, Baghdadi's deputy, Mohammed Adnani, who was the leader of all of their external operations. Um, that was a very significant uh, operation led by, of course, our colleagues in DOD, and one of the benefits and the fruits of, of the Monbij operation. I do not think it's a coincidence that after the loss of Monbij, after ISIL lost Monbij, a lot of their key leaders uh, left wherever they were and gathered in other places, we were able to track them uh, quite effectively. But through all of this intelligence and through all this information sharing and working as a global uh, coalition, uh, we're seeing more and more countries take action against um, ISIL or ISIL-affiliated fighters. These types of people are trying to uh, conduct inspired plots. So just I just want to kind of go through the list of countries just so you have a, a sense of the scope and breadth of this. I was in Canada yesterday, and we talked a lot about not just everything we're doing in Iraq and Syria as a, as a coalition, as a partner, and our Canadians, of course, are on the ground there in northern Iraq, uh, but also as law enforcement intelligence and constantly sharing information as a coalition. So countries in which uh, people have either been detained or prosecuted or they've broken up plots include in Europe, uh, Bulgaria, Germany, Spain, France, Montenegro, Italy, Turkey, of course, Netherlands. In the Middle East, Morocco, Algeria, all the way out to South Asia, Pacific, Indonesia, Singapore, Africa, South Africa, in Latin America, Brazil, and of course in, in North America here, we had a very successful uh, cooperative relationship with the Canadians, which stopped an attack before it was about to happen by a terrorist by the name of, of Aaron Driver. So, so is this is based on Monbij stuff? All of not all of it's based on oh, Monbij okay. stuff, but it's based upon the point of what we're doing as a coalition is not just what we're doing in Iraq and Syria, which I know gets a lot of the focus. It is about strengthening these ties uh, between all different branches of our government, sharing information to try to stay ahead of the threat. John, sorry, can you just clarify what you did and all that you disrupted plots or? Yeah, we can get you all the details okay. in every single country I, I listed. So these countries have either arrested individuals, um, you know, stop plots such as I just mentioned in Canada, but it's just a, a 
an example of the breadth and scope of what we're doing as a global coalition, because even after we get Daesh out of Iraq and Syria, which we will, we get them out of their physical space, they will remain a threat for some time. As I've said before here at this podium, this is an unprecedented threat. We've had 40,000 foreign fighters pour into Syria over five years from over 120 countries all around the world. That's twice as many of these you know, jihadist-oriented individuals that went into Afghanistan in the 80s, and we know where that led to, so we have to, we have to stay ahead of this. Let me give just a brief update of the situation in Iraq and Syria and how we're working to uh, really strangle what is left of their physical space. Uh, the number one on the map, I've discussed this for quite some time, this is the 98-kilometer strip of border that they controlled with Turkey. Um, they no longer control that strip of border with Turkey. Uh, the Turks obviously supporting a number of uh, moderate Syrian opposition groups moved into Jarabulus about a month ago. Uh, we are on the ground and helping them, and they have pushed to the west and cleared off that entire zone. And those forces are now moving towards uh, the strategically symbolic town of Dabiq. That is the name of, the, of ISIL's propaganda magazine, and they're going to have to find a new name for their propaganda magazine, which actually they already have. So in number two, uh, Raqqa. Raqqa remains their administrative capital. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, our partners, Syrian Arabs and Kurds, to build the force to begin to move the push on Raqqa. And that is something that we want to do uh, as soon as possible. We, of course, have people on the ground uh, working that now every single day. Let me focus, though, on number three, because this is Mosul. Um, it took some time to get in place to talk about uh, the actual liberation of Mosul. Mosul, of course, is where a Daesh burst onto the international scene. It's where Baghdadi declared his phony caliphate. And we are now have all the pieces in place to get Daesh out of Mosul. So I won't talk about the timing. I won't talk about the specifics uh, of the overall plan. But I will just talk about the extensive amount of planning that has gone into this. Uh, my Deputy General Terry Wolf is here. He spent about three and a half weeks in Iraq over 100 different meetings, helping to coordinate and bring everybody together to do this. There are four dimensions of the Mosul plan. Uh, one, of course, is the political dimension of the disposition of forces. We have built a force of over 30,000 for this total operation. That includes uh, Kurdish Peshmerga. It includes Iraqi security forces, their counterterrorism service forces. It includes local Nineveh tribal fighters. We hope to have about 14,000 of those. And, of course, local police. So getting all of these forces together and arranged and where they're going to go and what they're going to do uh, takes an awful lot of work. We worked very hard and had very close cooperation with our partners in Erbil and the Kurdistan Regional Government and President Masoud Barzani and the government in Baghdad to agree on the overall disposition of forces, where everybody will go, what they will do. That is now all agreed. So that is a very good uh, sign. And President Barzani's presence in Baghdad, uh, which some of you may have covered last week, was quite significant first time he visited Baghdad in some years, and much of it was focused on making sure we have the pieces in place uh, for the Mosul military operation. So the political agreements for how that's going to go are in place. The second dimension of the plan is humanitarian assistance. Uh, you may have seen some estimates of up to perhaps a million IDPs. Uh, that is kind of the apocalyptic scenario. That's the worst case scenario. We have to plan for the worst case scenario. Uh, but of course, I think that is uh, the real high end of what we might see. The plan is to keep people in their homes. And the messaging that is ongoing now for the people of Mosul is to keep people in their homes. Uh, one example of that was an operation that was done about two weeks ago in the town of Sharkat, south of Mosul. Uh, it, was a, it was a stronghold of Daesh. We thought it would take some weeks. It actually, uh, that, that town fell in about two days because the population rose up, kicked Daesh out as soon as the Iraqi security forces entered. And we did not have a serious uh, flow of, of refugees out of Sharkat. So the plan is to keep people in their homes, very methodical neighborhood by neighborhood. But of course, the unknown is, is what Daesh is going to do. Uh, we are now working every single day uh, with NGOs, with the Iraqi government, with the Kurdistan regional government, and local officials in Nineveh to pre-position resources for IDPs. We want to have enough in place to be sufficient to accommodate up to 1 million IDPs. Um, I think we'll definitely have enough for 750,000, again, preparing for the very worst case. Issues now are bound to we're securing additional land in case you do get the kind of worst case scenario, and we're doing that now. Uh, just yesterday, we had a very important meeting with the Governor of Iraq and the UN. Uh, the Governor of Iraq's directed construction of 20 additional emergency sites, and these things can be put up uh, pretty fast. So the humanitarian coordination is ongoing. Um, as you know, we have raised an awful lot of uh, funds and resources for this campaign. We had the uh, event here in July with the coalition. We raised over two, about $2.3 billion. We also had another event at the UN, at the UN General Assembly, 
uh, last week in which we raised another about $100 million. Um, I was in UAE just last week at a very good meeting with uh, His Highness bin Mohammed bin Zayed. They have put in about $60 million into the stabilization funding. So the resources are coming in. The resources are there. The issue is making sure that they are in the right pots in order to be spent immediately on the, on the needs as they, um, as they develop and the, as they evolve. The third dimension of the Mosul plan, and this has been going on now for many, many months, all each dimension of the plan, is stabilization. And the elements of stabilization, humanitarian assistance focused on taking care of people as they leave the city. Stabilization is focused on getting people back into their homes. And in Iraq, through our stabilization planning through the coalition, about a million IDPs are now back in their homes. Um, in Ramadi, now that we're finally getting IEDs out of the streets, it takes a lot of time to meticulously clear out all these IEDs. 200,000 people have now returned. Even in Fallujah, one of the most recent cities cleared, we have about 2,000 people now uh, back in their homes, and this will continue. So in, in Mosul, uh, we're focused on making sure we pre-position pre uh, the material that we will need to support people returning to their homes. We're also making sure that as IDPs come out of their homes, we're working closely with the Iraqis on this, that security screening is put in place and that's necessary to do, that we do not have the types of problems we had in Fallujah. So we're looking for independent screening mechanisms and also to make sure that armed groups that are not under the full control of the Iraqi government are not a part of the Mosul uh, campaign. So stabilization is the screening of IDPs, the police to come in and hold the, hold the city afterwards. The Army, of course, will have a significant role in holding. Um, and also making sure that we have the conditions in place to return people to their homes, learning the lessons we have already learned from Tikrit, from Ramadi, these other areas where we have seen IDPs return. Uh, the fourth dimension of the Mosul plan, I'm obviously hitting only the wave tops here, is the governance plan. Uh, the governance plan is focused on the existing Iraqi institutions. There is a governor of, of Nineveh province. His name is uh, Governor Nafal Agoub. Uh, he will, of course, be empowered as a body, Prime Minister body in Baghdad has really focused on trying to empower the governors and his policy of decentralization, empowering local leaders, empowering local people from the bottom up. Um, but Mosul is obviously a very big uh, challenge. So Pro President Barzani of the Kurdistan region will appoint somebody to be with uh, Governor Agoub. Uh, body's doing the same thing. We'll be with them and the UN to help manage uh, the overall uh, stabilization and governance aspects of Mosul. City is a big city, divided into eight districts, and actually who will govern each of those districts is something that we now uh, have in place. So we think the plan has come, is coming together quite well. That said, uh, this will be a very unpredictable, very dynamic, very uncertain operation. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns. We do not know what Daesh is going to do in Mosul. We have some estimates that they will stay and fight to the last man, as they tried to do in Mondage. We have some estimates that they're actually preparing to give up Mosul. Uh, we actually don't know. We will be prepared, again, for the worst case, uh, and we will develop the force and our advisors and all of our partners and uh, my colleagues in DOD will be helping to make sure that the force is able to win on the ground militarily, and then we will be working with our humanitarian colleagues to make sure that we're ready to handle the humanitarian flow that comes out. So we do not know exactly what Dash will do. Uh, we know pretty much uh, how they are positioned, but there's a lot of uncertainty here. So. Um, I think things will probably look, uh, you know, fairly uncertain. It's one of the most complex things the Iraqis have done. Um, but we have seen them do things now that were unimaginable two years ago. Uh, my final point, I'll get to questions. Just to set up this campaign to liberate Mosul, which was really the last step of this very difficult campaign against Daesh, um, the Iraqi security forces have charged up 80 to 100 kilometers up the Tigris Valley. They've done a, a river crossing. Uh, they have seized territory that uh, about a year ago it looked a little bit beyond their reach. They are acting uh, with professionalism and uh, with increasing confidence. The last time I was in Iraq, what I was really struck by uh, was the confidence among particularly the Iraqi security forces that they are going to defeat Daesh. It was a very different story even six months ago when some of these battles were extremely difficult. But this will be one of the hardest things they've done. Uh, it will obviously be a significant moment in our overall campaign. Um, but we need to focus on why this has to be done. There's over a million people in Mosul living under the, the boot of Daesh. We think most of the uh, Yazidi slaves who were taken by Daesh almost two years ago, a uh, vast majority of them are in Mosul. Uh, they are executing people in the streets. We are having increasing reports of Daesh terrorist fighters who are actually uh, shooting themselves in the leg or in the arm to try to get out of the fight. 
So there are signs that Daesh's morale is plummeting quite rapidly. Um, but there is a humanitarian imperative to get Daesh out of Mosul as soon as we can. Uh, and we think we are rapidly approaching that day. So that will unfold here uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, we'll, of course, be all over it with our team. And, um, and I'll keep, you know, we'll keep everybody updated as it goes on. I'll take a couple questions. Uh, I'll be very brief with one, and then I have to say one. Which is just, it's not on that map up there, but on the handout, it said there's 9-16 at the bottom. Does that mean that this was prepared September 16th? Uh, I don't see don't have that there. But, uh, so, yeah, so if, if you had the most updated, it's – Is are, that correct? It's, it's through August. So yeah, I know, but was, yeah. the, was this prepared on the 16th yeah, of September? Yeah, that is through August. I understand that. I just want to – Yeah, so – Do you uh, have any reason to believe that this has substantially changed since then? It's actually changed in a more positive way. So uh, just to situate you on this map, which you've, so many of you have seen before, uh, anything in color is territory that Dash at one point or another controlled. Everything in green is territory they have since lost. Uh, orange is where they still are. And the, the small red blotches are actually areas that they've gained. So if this map was updated, the number one, uh, there's a whole, this is all now uh, green. To about 15 kilometers in, there's a, they, have, they no longer control that border. That's what I mentioned before with the Turkish-led uh, operation with, with the opposition. Um, you'd also see some more green around uh, between Heat and Ramadi, because of the Euphrates Valley there. There have been a number of successful operations with Iraqi uh, tribes of Anbar province who are performing quite heroically against Daesh. All right. And then, so, okay. And then my second is unrelated, but it's it come up over and over and over again. And I just want to get your take on it because it involves you personally. And that is um, you've seen the report about the, these three documents that are sitting up on the hill in this skiff and that were uh, relate to the the Iran deal and the Bank Sepa and the, the prisoners being released. And it is alleged or said that uh, the date on the original was the January 16th, and that was scratched out, and the, the 17th was written instead. Can you explain it? What, is that true? And secondly, can you explain why? Um, what I can really say about that is, of course, as I think has been discussed many times here by uh, John and others, we had a number of strands of diplomacy come together at the exact same time on the same day. Um, and we had a very difficult 24 hours with the Iranians to finalize the prisoner trade. So a number of things were going on. We wanted to get a lot of business done the same day. There were a number of documents signed on that final day. And uh, so, you know, that's really what happened on the final day. Okay. Uh, Mike. Um, Brad, uh, apropos uh, Mosul, I've talked to a number of the interested parties who are concerned with the battle for Mosul, and they say that there is, in fact, no agreed political vision for what um, should happen in Nineveh province or in Mosul post-liberation. Governor Nujafi wants uh, basically an autonomous region, and he's advocated for that. Uh, some of the Kurds have talked about grafting parts of Nineveh province, maybe Sinjar and other areas, onto the KRG. It looks like the Iraqi government wants to keep things more or less the way they are, and they say the Americans have been reluctant to come in and impose a solution or enforce a solution prior to hostilities. Um, is there an agreed vision among all these parties? Have the people of Mosul, the Iraqi government, the Kurds all sat together and agreed on a political roadmap for Nineveh? Or is this something that you intend to work out after um, the uh, operation commences? Yeah, Michael, so it's a great question. And when you're in Iraq talking to all these, everybody has a different idea for how uh, Nineveh province should, should be governed, who should be the governor. Every other person you meet will say, I should be the governor, he should be the governor. Um, the problem here is that if you try to resolve all of those issues, Daesh will remain in Mosul for uh, the foreseeable future and perhaps forever. So what, what we have ag agreed with the Iraqis, it's their plan, uh, is that the same principles apply in Nineveh province that applied in Saladin province, which is also a very complex mosaic, mosaic and also an Anbar province. Uh, there are existing political institutions, the provincial councils, the governors, those leaders will be empowered. However, there is an important role for all the notables of Nineveh province and also Mosul. Uh, so one thing Terry did particularly when he was there for three and a half weeks was meeting with everybody, making sure that everybody feels invested in the future of Nineveh province and the future of Mosul. Um, but the governance plan will, will, will rely on the existing uh, political institutions. Um, so there will be an important role for all the notables of Mosul. Um, but the assessment from the Iraqis, which I very much agree with, is that it would be impossible to resolve all of these, all of these very difficult issues while Daesh is sitting in Mosul. 
Um, but we have worked very hard to make sure the humanitarian plan is as ready to go as possible, and I stress as possible, and the governance plan is also as ready to go as possible. So it will be a structure with the governor, with the provincial council, with a representative from the KRG and a representative from the government of Iraq, uh, together with us in the UN to help um, organize the, the post-Mosul future, uh, post-Dash future of Mosul. Um, but we think this is a pretty good structure. It has worked in all of these other areas. Every single city that has been taken by Daesh, nothing has been retaken by Daesh. Uh, that includes cities in which the governance plan was very clear, in which there was unanimity, and also uh, situations in which there really wasn't a good governance plan, and just organically there was stability afterwards, something we worked very hard on. Um, but just to the heart of your question, because it's a good one, is that if we try to resolve everything before Mosul, Daesh will never get out of Mosul. And this is really a war of momentum. Uh, we feel that momentum is on the side of the Iraqi security forces. Uh, they are the ones that will set the date for when this launches, and, uh, and we will support them when they're prepared to go. A um, couple of quick ones. First of all, if you could put out, as you said, like some information on those disruptions yeah, on the coalition that you said. Um, what kind of information, I don't know if you would, guys would be doing this, maybe more the Iraqi government, but what kind of information campaign is being done to educate the people of Mosul um, in terms of having information about what's coming and what they should be doing. And then is there any, um, in this uh, operation, is there a specific um, strategy to try and rescue? You, you mentioned uh, you think a lot of these Yazidi slaves are being held in Mosul. There is some um, expectation that they will try to move them if they leave this uh, city. And so is there a specific um, strategy to try and rescue some of these? Yeah, so it's a great question. So first, how do you uh, how do you communicate with the people of Mosul? This is very difficult. And um, uh, for example, we know where we'd like the IDP flows to go, um, but do you want to preview that uh, too early to give uh, the enemy exactly where they want the IDPs to go? Because we've seen Dash in other cities, Fallujah and elsewhere, assassinate civilians as they're trying to leave. Um, so we are doing leaflet drops quite constantly. The Iraqi Air Force are doing leaflet drops to the people of Mosul. And um, the Iraqis have also begun the radio station directly into uh, the heart of Mosul. Prime Minister Abadi addressed the people of Mosul on that radio station just two nights ago. So we're communicating with them a number of ways, um, but there is a balance between making sure the people of Mosul know as much as we want them that, that they need to know to protect themselves. The number one message that is going to them is the operation is designed to have them stay in their homes as much as possible. Um, so, but the radio, the radio station, and the leaflet drops are, are ongoing on a very regular basis. And your second question is a very good one, and it's something that um, I am very focused on with our team. Um, it's very hard to get a handle on exactly where these people are. I met with uh, one of the escaped Yazidi slaves, Nadi Murad, in New York uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, we are doing all we possibly can to try to find where these people are, and I, um, uh, we're going to try to make sure that. If Daesh escapes Mosul, which we'll, I don't think they'll be able to do, that they can't take these people with them. So it's a very good question. It's one of the most difficult questions, and uh, we want to free these people. That's one of the key objectives of the operation. Take the last one from Dave. Uh, in recent weeks, there's been a certain amount of tension and rhetoric between Baghdad and Ankara about the situation around Mosul. The Iraqi government has demanded the Turkish troops leave the area. The Turkish troops insist they have a role to play. Does that in any way undermine your planning? And do Turkish troops in Nineveh have a role in, in the upcoming Mosul operation? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I was in Ankara about 10 days ago uh, with De Deputy Secretary Blinken. Uh, we had very detailed discussions with uh, the Turks, with all levels of their government. Um, our principles on this um, are very clear. Um, all military activities in Iraq, this is a fundamental principle of ours, all military activities in Iraq have to be with the full consent and coordination of the government of Iraq. We do not do anything in Iraq as a coalition without the consent of the government of Iraq. Um, a second fundamental principle of ours is the sovereignty of Iraq and the ter territorial integrity of Iraq. So those are fundamental principles of ours that we will um, adhere to. Um, this deployment to Bashika uh, happened a little over a year ago. Um, been through it some time before. There was either some miscommunication or something, but it did not have that consent of the government of Iraq that uh, we would require uh, before a military force comes into Iraq. That said, they have trained a number of local uh, Nineveh fighters, um, and we are prepared to incorporate those fighters into the operation under the Iraqi command. Uh, the, the key principle when it comes to Mosul is there is one plan, there is one command. 
any armed groups outside of that structure are going to be a very serious problem. Um, so obviously we're working very closely with our partners in Baghdad uh, to help resolve this issue diplomatically, and uh, we'll be very seized with that over the coming days. They will not have any role with that. Uh, 14,000 local popular mobilization, local volunteers from Nineveh, similar to as we done, have done in Anbar province, and uh, the role of the Hashal Shabi uh, from the south, we think we have that worked out politically. But there are a lot of wild cards here, so I, I don't want to predict the future. Uh, we're trying to make sure this is done in a way that gives the people of Mosul confidence that the liberation forces are uh, the disciplined Iraqi security forces, uh, and that they will have a much better life after Daesh. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, just a programming note here. Um, Secretary will travel to Kigali, Rwanda, uh, on the 13th and 14th of October to join EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy and others in striving to achieve U.S. Uh, climate and environmental goals at the upcoming meeting of the parties to the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer is widely regarded to be one of the most successful environmental treaties ever and was the first treaty to achieve universal ratification. This global agreement has put the stratospheric ozone layer on a path to recovery through measures to control production and consumption of ozone-depleting substances. Negotiations in Kigali will be an important opportunity to reach global agreement on an ambitious amendment to the protocol to phase down the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, uh, or HFCs. HFCs uh, have become popular substitutes for ozone-depleting substances, but while they are far better for the ozone layer, they are also potent greenhouse gases, which means that they do contribute to climate change. An ambitious HFC amendment would build on the positive momentum of the Paris Agreement and could avoid up to a half a degree of Celsius warming by the end of this century. So the uh, Secretary is very much looking forward uh, to going to Kigali and to uh, embarking on those negotiations. Matt. Thank you. Um, before we get into policy stuff, is it, is it correct that you guys are putting out another batch of uh, former Secretary Clinton's emails today? Yes. At uh, 3.30 this afternoon, we expect to be able to post uh, on our website uh, another uh, batch of emails. Now, this is this, these emails come from the materials provided by the FBI. Can you give, any, give us any more <laughs> idea of what's coming? Yeah. So we'll be making, releasing approximately 75 documents, totaling approximately 270 pages of emails reflecting work-related communications involving Secretary Clinton. Uh, this will be our first substantial release of materials that we received from the FBI. I think, as you guys know, we were ordered by the court to process 350 pages of material received from the FBI by today, the 7th of October, and we met that requirement. So to be clear, we're going to be releasing approximately 270 pages of the approximately 350 pages that we process. Why is there a difference of age? Because processing doesn't mean releasing. There were, in many cases, uh, either actual duplicates of material that we already had posted from the 55,000, um, and, uh, and then there were also, inside the batch that we got from the FBI, there were duplicate documents. No sense in posting two when one is exactly the same. So, and, and processing. Well, the only thing is that we, I mean, we, we, we're, we, we're taking your word for that. Yes, you are. Okay. Do you have reason to no, suspect my have, word? No, I don't have any reason to suspect anything. I'm just saying if the court ordered you to they, release 350 pages. No, they didn't. Pages. No, the order was to process, not uh, to release. Okay. Right. To process, Sorry, to work through that. 350, which we did. Okay. And of those 350, 270 uh, uh, will be released today. Okay. Um, on to uh, Syria and the Secretary's comments earlier this morning. One is, do you know uh, what strike he was talking about in his comments overnight in the hospital? I think the Secretary is referring to actually to uh, uh, a strike that we, uh, we saw happen yesterday um, uh, on a uh, field hospital uh, in uh, Rif, Damascus government. I'm not exactly positive that that's what he was referring to, but I think he was referring to actually one that was not one that, in Aleppo. 
uh, I, I believe it was, it, I think it was, I think you, my guess is, I'm guessing here, that he was a bit mistaken on location and referring to one, uh, there was a, a field hospital uh, in uh, Rith, Damascus, government. Um, so I think I think he was referring to one yesterday. Definitely yesterday, though. It wasn't one from Wednesday. I think he was referring to one yesterday. And I know of another one on a hospital Monday. Um, but I think that's what he was Is was there a way you guys to. can check? We did. Things? I mean, believe me, I knew I was going to get asked this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we looked at it. And, uh, but you and don't I have think certainty, though. I don't. Best I best I got. Best information I got is that uh, he was most likely referring to one yesterday uh, in the, the, in this government. But I, you know, if he could, if could we can, just be if we can nail that state. down with with certainty, what he was talking about. I will do the best I can okay. in that. But again, I, I, knowing knowing I was going to be asked this today, yeah. I did try right. to do as much research as <clears> I could. I, I could okay. not find one last night that, uh, in, in Aleppo. Of, uh, Twenty and hundred. Yeah, uh, I, I recognize that. I I I, I, can, I can't okay. corroborate that. Uh, but look, if, if, if you know, let's Look, take ten steps back here. I mean, over the last two weeks, we think almost four hundred people have been killed in Aleppo alone. Um, so whether or not there was a strike last night in a hospital or, or Aleppo is kind of beside the point. The point he was, the broader point that he was trying to make is that, that uh, the Russians and the Syrian regime continue this onslaught on Aleppo. And just over the last two weeks alone, as I said, almost 400 people, best we can tell, uh, have, have been uh, killed. That doesn't even count the wounded. Can then, um, then get, so if we could get clarity on that, that would I will be great. do but that I can, second, Matt, but I, I can't would also like. That. Also seeking um, clarity on who exactly does the secretary believe should do this investigation into possible war crimes? Um, because if it's the ICC to which you're not a party, I mean that has got to go through the Security Council. Syria is not a uh, party, neither is Russia, and it's got so it's got to go through the Security Council. And there's, you know, the, the chances of that. Um, happening, in other words, a Security Council referral, I, 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 are less than slim and none. I think the Secretary was referring um, to his view that there should be, that these yeah, these right. actions beg for a, an appropriate but investigation. He who? wasn't, well, he wasn't, he, he wasn't getting ahead of the process. He was simply referring to the fact that, that we know these acts are violations of international law and they should be so investigated and appropriately so. He wasn't, uh, that, that was the extent of his comment. That was the extent of the point he was trying to make. He well, wasn't trying he to get just, ahead of the process. Was he just trying to make the point that these look like war crimes as opposed to formally calling for a war crimes investigation? And to that point, I mean, it's no secret that the U.S. has been working with Syrian groups and others to try and document some of these atrocities as potential war crimes for future accountability down the road. I think, again, you heard him say when he was up at the, the UN a couple of weeks ago, he talked about how uh, the actions of the regime in particular uh, were uh, violations of international law. And uh, I mean, we're talking about bombing hospitals and bombing first responders and killing innocent civilians, not by accident, but on purpose. And uh, so this isn't the first time he's talked about the fact that these are violations of international law. And again, today he was simply making the point uh, that because we believe they're violations, they should be appropriately investigated. I understand, but I mean, it does seem... Uh, I've mean, answered that question. I'm not, he wasn't trying to make a, a specific point about by whom. Uh, I understand that, but it does seem as if, you know, there is a violation of international law and there's war crimes. And war crimes come, that is obviously a legal determination that comes with right. a lot more um, mm -hmm. responsibility to you know, hold right. those accountable. And I'm wondering where this building and where this administration is in terms of determining whether these are war crimes and trying to document them as such for some type of future accountability, regardless of who right now is investigating it. We certainly believe that, uh, that the violations we've seen and the strikes and the attacks and the manner in which that they have been conducted merit and deserve uh, an evaluation, a review, an investigation, call it what you will, um, as potential war crimes. Now, you're right that there's a very specific legal technical definition. I'm not an expert on that, wouldn't pretend to be, uh, that comes with, with making that determination. 
And the Secretary wasn't making that determination today. He was saying that these actions beg an appropriate investigation. Well, but by saying that these accusations beg an investigation on war crimes, again, regardless who does it, that would suggest that he wants to know whether these are war crimes or fit the legal definition or not. And again, that would cause a whole, you know, open up a whole other avenue of potential measures, policy decisions, and such. Well, again, I'm not going to get ahead of the process, and I don't think the Secretary was trying to do that either. I think he was giving an honest, his honest view that, um, that these violations of international law should be properly investigated um, for the potential to be determined as war crimes, and that, and we've said this before, that, that, uh, that if such a determination is made, people need to be held so to account. So is he kind of throwing but, it out there, like whoever wants to investigate it as war crimes should do so? Or is he saying that He was simply saying that he believes these actions beg an appropriate investigation. And is he, he wasn't making a determination or offering okay. an opinion or review well, is he willing of who to should do it or when. Is he willing, as he's done with the other I think things, this is a discussion he that he thinks should happen inside the UN and inside the international community. on all the information that it has gathered that Russia has committed war crimes in Syria? I, I would, again, point you back to what he said at the UN uh, and, and, uh, and what he said today, that uh, he said that, that these strikes are clear violations of international law. That's not what he said today. No, but he said that at the UN. I remember. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's important, though, to go back. To, this isn't a new idea here, what he said today. Um, and. Uh, and what he said today was, these acts, these acts which we, which he has said publicly, uh, have violated international law, ought, ought, to, ought to be appropriately in investigated. But are we, are we ready now to make that call and say, yep, absolutely, no? That's why he wants to see them looked okay, into. So you're not ready to say that you believe that that Russia has committed war crimes? In, no, and the secretary in didn't allude to that today. I, I got it. Okay. So, and then second thing, um, <clears throat> do you think it is fair, based on what he said today? to say that he is <clears throat> calling for an investigation, not just that this cries out for investigation, but that he's actually calling for one? Or, well, is that, I mean, or, or does it stop short of that? I, I don't, um, I mean, I don't know how helpful it is to, to parse the, the, the verbs. Uh, I would just point you back to That's what he actually, said. Actually, it's very important. I would point you back to what he said himself, which that these are acts that beg for an appropriate investigation of war crimes. So if you're asking me, would he like to see them appropriately investigated? My answer is yes, uh, and that's right from what he said. And I think I'd leave it at that. Would he like to see whom do the investigation? He didn't. He, again, the secretary is not getting ahead of a process here, uh, but he does think that this is a conversation worth having inside the international community. To just regard this then as kind of a rhetorical exercise to kind of increase the pressure on the Russians before the vote at the UN Security Council, and 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 essentially all you're doing is just upping the rhetoric. But you're not actually saying you believe war crimes are committed. You're not actually calling for well, an investigation of war crimes. You're not actually directly accusing the Russians of war crimes. You're just tossing some words around ahead of a Security Council vote. Is that is that the way to look at this? No, I wouldn't look at it that way at all. And the Secretary of State, he doesn't just toss words around uh, for rhetorical exercises. Um, you have seen his frustration build. You yourself, all of you have seen his frustration build over the last several weeks. Um, you heard what he said at the UN, called it like he saw it, that these were clear violations of international law. And today, um, he said that they beg for an appropriate investigation. And I think he meant every word of what he said. I'm not trying to parse here. I'm not trying to be to dance around this thing. Um, uh, but the secretary believes that what's happening um, is an abomination. Is obviously violates international law. We're talking again. Let's remember and let's remind people. We're talking about hospitals, and homes, and businesses, so why and innocent there been men, an women, and children. So why hasn't there been an investigation thus far? I then? can't answer that question. At why least, but I can tell you that the secretary is interested in seeing that move forward. Are you ready to spearhead that kind of investigation? I'm not going to get ahead of a specific process well, here, Elise. Why, as Arshad said, isn't it, if, if, he did, if he said it and he's not willing to move forward with that, he was just throwing out an idea? I don't understand what... I, I think, as I said to Arshad, he's interested in having a conversation inside the international Is community about this. Is he going to start having this. that conversation with I, his counterpart? I think you can safely assume that uh, uh, international leaders have already talked about the degree to which these violations are, in fact, violations of international law. Uh, you know, that, that, that 
Syria is not a state party to the Rome Statute, so to the, the court, the United States does not have jurisdiction automatically. And you also know that the only way, therefore, for it to have jurisdiction is for it to be referred, for the matter to be referred by the Security Council, where Russia, as you finally know, has a veto. So given that, right, given that the one court in the world that's supposed to deal with these kinds of issues, yeah. right, can't unless Russia agrees to be investigated, which seems impossible, why shouldn't one regard it all as a rhetorical exercise? Because you know the ICC ain't going to get jurisdiction to look into this. Well, again, uh, Arshad, fair, fair question, but I'm simply not going to get ahead of uh, the legal process here. Um, I'm not educated mm -hmm. enough to do that in the first place, and secondly, that wasn't the Secretary's intent today. Um, he was expressing the frustration he has seen, the fact that he does believe an appropriate investigation uh, uh, is, is, is warranted, and, you know, that's a discussion that he and other international leaders have to have in terms of process and how that would be done. I take your points about uh, the ICC, and I take your point about the UN Security Council and Russia's veto. Um, uh, I think you can safely assume that the Secretary was aware of both those facts uh, when he talked about this in the General Assembly and when he talked about it today, standing next to Foreign Minister Ayro. Quick, quick one on that. Are you expecting a vote tomorrow, and will he go up for it if there is one? This, I don't have any travel to New York City to, to announce uh, on, uh, on the Secretary's behalf. The point of what he said was to start a conversation inside the inter international community. I mean, it, it seems to me there's been conversation going on for the last five years. If he feels that strongly about it, why isn't it time to move beyond the He's referring the to what's been happening in the last several weeks in Aleppo specifically, Matt. Well, but look, obviously but there's, there's been... been a, everyone is... There's a lot of talk. It's all talk, 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 talk. And then it sounds like this is just more more talk. Where is... does it, if, if he feels that strongly, why is not... Why is there not... Why, why is that talk turning into some kind of Matt, action? I'm not, it it very well might, Matt. I, 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 right. I, mean, I, I can't... I'm not going to rule out the fact that it won't lead to, to some action. Yeah, go ahead. Earlier this week, the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN uh, talked about this particular issue and said that um, that Syria and Russia and you know that the that, that the UN should change the rules about who can, how countries are referred to the International Criminal Court um, so that countries that wield the veto power can't um, can't prevent themselves from being referred to. Um, to, to the ICC. Does the, um, does the Secretary, does the State Department, uh, you know, agree with that position now? I'll have to take the question. I don't I don't know if we have a view on that proposal. Can, yeah. I, can I just ask on, uh, I mean, I mean I think I'm sorry, but why not? I mean, that's, it's very germane to this particular issue that we're, that you guys are all frustrated about for the past two weeks. Your, your question implies that we haven't taken a view. I don't know. Uh, the reason why I'm not answering your question is, is because I don't know, and I'm not going to get up here and wing it for you. So I will take your – that's why I said I'll take your question, sir, and we'll get back to you. So don't, don't presume by the fact that I'm taking your question that there's no opinion here in the, in the building. Uh, it just means that I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, some of the confusion today is that Kerry's remarks were seen as a change in stance, that it was seen as a, a stronger statement that he had issued before explicitly calling for a war crimes investigation. So I just have two questions. Are you, one, saying that this does not reflect a change in stance, that, that, that his comments today do not mark a shift in tone, and also is it – there's confusion about the fact that he was presumably referring to an event that led him to give this sharper statement, are you saying you can't identify with certainty what that event was, which attack he was specifically He was referring to? specifically, the, the acts he was referring to were about uh, recent siege activity this around one Aleppo. He said 20 dead, 100 wounded. You guys don't know. I don't have specific event. information on that particular event. I told you before. I tried to research that before coming out here. I don't have any specifics, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that in this week alone, since Monday, we know of at least two attacks on hospitals, and that over the last two weeks, almost 400 people have been killed. Okay. Um, so he's talking, when he talks about these acts beg for an appropriate investigation, he's not simply talking about the one strike uh, that, he's, that he detailed for you today. So, and then on the change of tone, I, I, uh, I don't see this as a change of tone, uh, and I've been with him. Uh, now, throughout this uh, process, uh, he, uh, you, I can point you back to what he 
said at the UN uh, during the uh, General Assembly, I mean, this, this is not a new idea, as I said to Arsha, not a new idea for him that these are violations of international law. And we have long said uh, that, that, uh, that people should be held to account for these violations. So it's not a big leap at all for him to say that it would beg for an appropriate investigation. Sure, go ahead, Saeed. Proposal. You know, he, he suggested that the Nusra and the militants pull out of, uh, of Aleppo. Uh, would you su support something like this, or would you have a mechanism, or would you suggest a mechanism to do that? Well, uh, we've seen the, the special envoy's uh, uh, proposal. We understand the uh, frustration behind it. Um, and uh, what, what I would say is uh, we're going to continue to have a healthy conversation with Stefan de Mistura about the way ahead, about trying to get to a ceasefire, to a cessation of hostilities. And what needs to happen, Saeed, mm -hmm. more critically, is that the siege of Aleppo needs to stop. Right. Okay, well, let me just follow up with, with the numbers. Do you have any, on the, on the figure, do you have any actual numbers on the number of militants that are in eastern Aleppo? I can't because verify. The figures suggest anywhere between six to 8,000. Some say there is 1,000 Nusra in eastern Aleppo and so on. How do you? Determine how I many can't. I can't validate those numbers. Um, yeah. I would have point you to Mr. Demastura to do that. Um, uh, we, and we've said this before, uh, that we don't believe that Al Nusra comprises anywhere near a majority uh, of the fighters um, in Aleppo. But I, I couldn't give you an exact figure. I can't verify those numbers. My last question on this. My last question on this is uh, that the suggestion by the Syrian government that if uh, if the militants surrender, give up, they, they have amnesty. Do you have any comment on that? I mean, I'm sorry. That, the Syrian government suggested that if the militants surrender and give up their arms, they, uh, you know, they, they will be given amnesty. Do you? I, I think anybody you, that would take that at face value, I think anybody that would take at face value anything coming out of the regime uh, would, the would be forced, given, given what this regime has proven capable of doing. Yeah, but then, uh, and I don't see it, the, 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 the continued bombing and siege of Aleppo um, isn't going to reduce the fervor with which many in the opposition are fighting. Um, and uh, I think it would, you know, we've seen time and time again the, the Assad regime promising to do something and then failing to do it. So I don't know how anybody could take that wait, as a, you as just, a, you just a credible said, offer. But wait a minute. You just said that the lifting of the siege of Aleppo would not stop the opposition from fighting with the fervor that which they're fighting? No, I said absent. Okay, I'm absent. sorry. So, okay, so if, I mean, I, I think it's a long shot that Nusser is just going to be like, sure, let me just get safe passage out of the city. Um, but what? let's just hypothetically, if, if you could find a way to implement this proposal that would in fact get the Russians to lift the siege um, I don't know if it would or not. To lift the siege of Aleppo, uh, would you support safe passage of Al Nusra out of the Al Nusra city? remains a party uh, outside. I'm sorry, outside. But you want to separate them. So where are they supposed to outside go? Outside the cessation of hostilities. No, I understand. But you can't, on one hand, say that you're going to ask them to separate, and on the other hand, not give them a chance to separate. I, okay, I can't speak for uh, the likelihood. Of, what incentive uh, that, do they have to separate? I can't speak for the likelihood that that proposal uh, I would work, just, and I'm not going to speculate about but that. On a more what needs to happen is I the siege of Aleppo needs to stop. This goes. This is a very fundamental question of your one responsibility under this agreement, supposed agreement that is you're trying to get back on track, that you would separate Nusra from the opposition. Now, if you separate them, where are these Nusra people supposed to go? If you if you could get rid of them. Maybe you could stop the ceasefire, right? You could stop the bombing, right? Al Nusra has remained obviously an obstacle to peace in Syria, okay, and that so they are outside the cessation of hostilities. We have long said, uh, uh, and we have uh, talked to uh, opposition groups, the ones that we influence, and, and we know that uh, other countries who have influenced other other groups have talked to them about uh, the need to separate. Uh, uh, we've also said that uh, the the siege itself. The continued bombing and violence perpetrated by Assad and by Russia um, is having exactly the opposite effect. It's actually encouraging more marbleization, if you will, uh, by the continued violence. It's 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 not certainly not uh, encouraging uh, opposition groups to separate. 
it's it's uh, increasing, as I said. It's, yeah, it's increasing their fervor to fight. I'm not going to speculate about the likelihood of success or uh, uh, out of the proposal that Mr. De Mistura put forward. We understand uh, the frustration with which he, he made it and, and did it. We all share that frustration. But how other? And I can't. I'm not going to. I can't speculate about what ifs here. I understand. What I, I what but, we want to see is the siege stop. I understand you do, but again, you want to separate them. How do you propose that you do that? Where how do where if they're all in the city, what are they supposed to go to the right, well, right the bank of the city I, and the I, other? I'm, I, I'm not an expert in the in the, in the geography there. Uh, what. What I would tell you is we continue to have conversations with the opposition about the importance of not being co-located uh, with al-Nusra. Uh, and that is a conversation so we continue to have. So you're totally up to the opposition to separate themselves? It, this is ultimately, and we, I've said this, so at least these are decisions they have to make. get out of the way so that we could bomb them. They and, have, these are decisions they have to make, and we've talked to them very honestly about that. You know, for instance, uh, that's Italy, 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 that's Italy, that's Italy, 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 they, could, would they would they be allowed to pass it to Idlib, for instance? Uh, Saeed, I'm simply not. You're not really giving them a lot of detail. incentive to separate themselves, are you? I mean, it is the it is the Russians and the Syrians, the, the regime, uh, which is certainly not giving any incentive to separate. In fact, quite the opposite by the continued bombing of civilian targets and of opposition elements. We talked about this before uh, when the uh, when the cessation of hostilities was announced, um, and about how how these, these uh, opposition forces are supposed to separate from, from Nusra, but if they do so, they would be, um, they'd be ceding territory, basically, to whoever attacks al Nusra and takes that territory. So it, it seems like, I mean, not only is there not incentive for them to do it now, but it seems like there never was an incentive for them to do it. I, I think you'd have to talk to each group about their, uh, what they consider their no, I'm incentives. Talking, I'm talking to you because you're, you guys came up, the Americans came up with this plan. I recognize that you're talking to me. And <laughs> what I've been saying and have said many, many times uh, is that we have made the case to the opposition that being co-located with Nusra, since Nusra is outside the cessation of hostilities, is a dangerous endeavor. But these are choices they have to make. We also understand they're not monoliths, uh, even not just in an aggregate but amongst themselves. And many of them have more radical views than others. Many of them make pragmatic decisions on their own about wh where they're going to physically be located. Those are decisions that they have to make as groups, and some of those individuals have to make as individuals. It doesn't change the, the, the fact that we think it, it is important for them to separate themselves from al-Nusra since al-Nusra remains outside the cessation of hostilities. A cessation of hostilities, by the way, which we don't have right now because the regime and Russia continues to bomb uh, in Aleppo. Kind of the point. You keep saying that outside the cessation of hostilities, but that that's that, that animal is dead. It's extinct. I just said that. I yeah, I know. So what what's the point then? Well, we obviously want to get back to it. What I said was uh, obviously it's not in force now, but but that doesn't violate the principle with which it was established back in February and the fact that we want to get back to it, Matt. When was it ever enforced? There were times, and you know there were times, especially in February, we had a, a significant reduction in the violence after no, it was No, 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 no. That's people were observing it. When was it enforced? When were violations of the cessation, when it existed, ever? When was anyone well, ever held to account? It? By enforced, I mean implemented. I recognize that there have been violations since it was first implemented. Okay. Um, and, there's, uh, and, and up until recently, we had a task force uh, bilaterally with the Russians to examine uh, and to monitor violations. Can there hasn't, well, I just, there hasn't been any more contact between the Secretary and former Mr. Lyman. I don't have any it. additional contact and to read out. It's uh, on uh, Wednesday, the Council General of India, along with uh, the Chair of Diwali Stamp and uh, B VP of USPS, they issued a historic uh, forever Diwali Stamp, which is a Festival of Lights. It's a you know we always ask you the negative uh, on negatives. So this is a yes, positive. you do. So do you have anything to say on that? Actually, I do. Thanks. We're Thank pleased you. to note. Are you wait, wait, you, you have something to say about the post office issuing a forever Diwali stamp? I do. Okay. Well. Are you writing down? Well, Are you ready? Well, well, why why you word for word. <laughs> <laughs> 
we're actually very pleased to note that the U.S. Postal Service commemorated uh, the Hindu festival of Diwali with a forever stamp. Uh, as you know, that stamp was unveiled at the Indian Consulate in New York on Wednesday. Um, the, post service, the Postal Service receives approximately 40,000 suggestions for stamp ideas annually from the public. Uh, um, 25 suggestions are selected uh, by the committee for the Postmaster General's approval. Um, and as millions around the world celebrate Diwali at the end of the month, we, we certainly wish them uh, the best. Kashmir? The two nuclear armed countries that have fought three wars. Be about, about you know, tensions rising. Anything, We've been talking anything? about that all week. And got, any, got anything to say about that today? Well, we continue to want the, the two sides to work this out, to have dialogue, and, and but to, you, to work but out But you still haven't confirmed that there was a surgical strike from India to Pakistan. I, I'd let uh, I'd let Indian authorities uh, speak to that. What we want to see is the tensions de-escalate. This is going to be very brief, I know. Yeah, I'm going to have to get down Yeah, this is, but uh, we, there was a story this morning, I don't know if you saw it, an AP story, about um, uh, the importation or the sales, online sales of, of uh, opioids called fentanyl, um, which is very dangerous and is responsible for all sorts of overdoses in the United States, all over North America, actually all over the world. I'm just wondering, um, in the story, it talks about effort, U.S. efforts, uh, as well as the efforts of others, to crack down on this kind of thing and I'm, uh, this kind of sale, uh, this kind of commerce. And I'm just wondering if you can give a, any kind of an update as to where, how, how far, where, and how far you think you've gotten with the Chinese on this. I cannot, Matt. I'm going to have to take that question. Okay. Uh, if there was a stamp for Lunar New Year, would you have something to say about that? I suppose if there was one, but okay. I'm not aware of one. Yeah. In, in a, taking the temperature again um, of, of U.S.-Russian uh, relations, uh, something hearkening back to the Cold War era now, the Russians are saying that they're considering plans to restore military bases and. Vietnam and Cuba in light of the improved relations between Vietnam and Cuba with the United States. Uh, how do you perceive these potential uh, I would say a couple of things on that. I mean, these are obviously overseas basing is, uh, those are sovereign decisions that two states need to work out. We have overseas bases, other, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and there are obviously other nations around the world that also uh, possess and hold overseas bases. Uh, uh, it's not uncommon. Um, I can't speak for the motivation that might be driving. Uh, uh, if in fact they are, I've seen the press reporting. But if in fact they are pursuing that, that's those are those are decisions, uh, the motivations that they need to speak to, uh, not not me. Um, uh, there's, we have obviously good relations with uh, uh, with Vietnam, and we're trying to now. Um, get into a position where we can have better relations with uh, with Cuba. I mean, the normalization process is only just getting started. There's a long way to go. Um, uh, but uh, but these are obviously decisions that states need to, to work out amongst themselves. Um, and uh, uh, there's no, I mean, d depending on the purpose behind it, there's uh, you know, there's there's no great sense of angst here by uh, one nation uh, looking to explore the notion of overseas basing. Um, it, it really goes to it really goes to intent, and only they can speak to intent. There was no there would be no great sense of angst about having a Russian base in Cuba again. I, I think look, this is a these are decisions that that Russian leaders and Cuban leaders would need uh, uh, to work out. Uh, The fact is we have overseas bases ourselves, um, and we're very comfortable with our overseas presence. Um, and it's not uncommon for other nations to, to do that. Um, so I think they would have to speak for the motivation here. Can I ask you something on Vietnam? I think you may be ready for it. The, the Vietnamese government today declared a California-based group as terrorists. Do you have any have they raised this with the United States directly, or is this just something that they've said, or you do anything about this? I don't know. I'm going to have to take that. I, I, I haven't seen that. Yeah. I, I've got, I've got, I've really got to go. Yes, sir, can I come on? Yes, sir, Would you comment on the Nobel Prize? On the what? On, on the fact that the Colombian president received the Nobel Prize. Would you comment on that? Well, we, the secretary put a statement out. Yeah. I understand. I'd point you to that. I mean, obviously, we can. There were two parties to this, you know, to this concluded 
peace deal, but they gave it to the president and not to the rebels. Do you have any comment well, That's on that? a decision that the Nobel Committee makes, Saeed. Obviously, we congratulate President Santos for his selection. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hinted at a further prov provocative action um, and said that the U.S. will face a gruesome reality in the near future. We are wondering if you had any reaction to this statement and how you see North Korea's recent activities. The same way we have seen uh, uh, North Korean provocative activities, uh, which we continue to condemn and uh, to call for them to, to take the tension down on the peninsula, not add to it through rhetoric and through action. We obviously take their words seriously uh, 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 because they have proven uh, willing uh, to conduct provocative activity in the past. That's why we continue to work with the international community on uh, the potential for even stiffer sanctions going forward inside the UN. And um, so there's been um, reports of some increased activity at a North Korean uh, launch site. Um, and there's a possibility that a nuclear test or missile launch may happen tomorrow or the day after. Has the U.S. seen any signs of this? And uh, is the U.S. preparing for this possible? Day? I mean, we've certainly seen reports about that, uh, but I, as you know, I don't talk about intelligence matters here. It's the 10th anniversary, I think, of the North Korean nuclear program, isn't it? So is there an extra concern? Is this a period that you're watching? I think we're this? always concerned about the potential for is their this a provocative. Period? We're always concerned about the potential for their provocative activity. Um, and we've seen reports on this. I'm just not in a position uh, to, you know, to confirm intelligence here from the podium. I do want to go back. One thing that, uh, that you were asking me about the Russian basing. When I say no particular angst, it's at this point in time with just a statement in the press like that, obviously. But what I would add to my answer to you is it's too soon to know uh, whether uh, uh, there needs to be uh, – uh, alarm or concern about this, uh, given that it was something that they just put out in, in the media. So I want to clarify my answer to you. I don't want to make it sound dismissive, okay. but it's just too soon to know based on the information that we have, which isn't much, uh, about their intentions. But it really does come down to the intentions of the overseas, uh, overseas base. The, on the Philippines that was going to be asked uh, before you go? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one off to be the last one. Go ahead. One of the latest comments, uh, from the defense minister and the talk of uh, suspension, suspending joint exercises. I know we talked about, uh, like yesterday, we were talking about um, the relations are still strong, but uh, this seems to be like the first tangible break. And so if you had a reaction to that, are you communicating with the, the Philippines at all about this? Uh, I saw those comments, and uh, we checked with our colleagues at the Defense Department. Uh, they're not aware of any official notification uh, of, uh, of the curtailment. Uh, of these activities. Um, here at the State Department, we are likewise not aware of any official notification of, of the curtailment. Um, so as I said yesterday, and as I said I think every day that we've talked about this since, um, uh, that um, we're focused on the very real, very significant security commitments we have through our alliance with the Philippines. Um, and uh, we think comments like this, whether they are or will be backed up by actual action or not, um, are really at odds with the closeness of the relationships that we have uh, with the people of the Philippines and which we fully intend to, to continue. Guys, I've got to go. i got to go. Thank you. Thanks.